people at Epton and, and the Living Classroom at Bingara and hopefully Snelk and Armadale and all the other regions because that's what we need to do. But yeah, so this amazing, miraculous substance that was the earth, you know, and, and I was thinking another thing I'd like to say tonight is, you know, we, we hear about the triple bottom line, you know, social, economic, environmental and balancing that and we all try to do that but I think what you know the government has forgotten in their emphasis on the economy is that the triple bottom line or, or the three-legged stool if you like has got a foundation underneath it called the earth which is largely um, made up of this beautiful substance humus which permeates the whole matrix um, and that's where life came from. So, so it's just this amazing, amazing substance, and there's so many properties um, there to it. So, so yeah, I've um, been sort of working out. You know, I worked out. You know, the water, the water storage capacity of, of humus and the carbon sequestration potential, the human health aspects of amazingly valuable contributions of this substance that we just said we didn't need any more when MPK came along. <laughs> but but it actually held the nutrients as well. It did, you know, it did everything. And you know, we need to really get back to respecting this amazing, amazing stuff. So then it was a case for us, I was still my main job was not to be a human scientist, was to actually be a farm manager. So okay, I'm sort of starting to get like, you know, for me it wasn't just about increasing pasture and cattle. It was actually about connecting my landscape to the water cycle and to climate, to human health. So every day in my management for 20 years has been trying to do that and I think that's what we all need to do. If we want a stable climate, if we want a functioning water cycle, if we want a healthy population, then every day that we're farming, we need to connect to all of those things as well. So it's made my job rather large because not only have I had to do that, I've had to go and try and tell the politicians they need to have policies in that area as well. But, you know, it's a beautiful space that we need to get into, you know, that, that we're fully connected to the planet we live in. Um, yeah, I could probably keep going, but I think I'm probably getting near time. No, not near time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. Um, yeah. When what sort of, like, with your, the start of your farm, where you first came out, where is it up to now and numbers and has the numbers improved or? Yeah, thanks very much Paul because you just got me back on track. Yeah, we were travelling around 7 DSC per hectare on the Drafton property when I got there yep. and now we're running pretty well a cow to the hectare so it's sort of running on 16, 17. Yeah, right. it can do better in, in better times but that's it's running a cow to the hectare without any feed right now. It's had two dry years and this one hasn't been fantastic. So, but you know, Grafton was my sort of learning place at that time. And, and when I got there, it was bare as, as I said, no water cycle, no, no grass, very poor cattle, no trees. They, they cleared the previous manager, hated trees. He, he slashed the new trees, the previous manager before him put them. Um, so it was bare as, 44 degrees. Um, and like now, and there's a fire very close to that property now, it was covered in smoke the whole time, so it was just a damn depressing place to be. And that's what I started with and 20 years ago. And I, and I, I decided to study humans. And um, a couple of years ago, we, um, we had a field day with 120 people. Some of you may have been there, but, but we ac I actually took great pleasure and said, I want to talk to you in the middle of this pasture which oh, I should have bought the photos, I had some good photos, but there's a photo of my son and myself riding in that paddock on horses and, and the ground is just like concrete. And when we walked 120 people in, I lost them because the grass was over their heads basically. So it, it, it's great to sort of do all the homework and research and, and have this beautiful vision of what humans can do in regenerative farming, but when you actually see a property transform like I've seen down there. That was, so that was my first project, 10 years. We, we, we had the place really, really humming without hardly any, any fertiliser at all. There was, there was minimal 
mineral input, and I'm a big believer in balancing some minerals, but very minimal. Um, and a, and back to my point was yeah, we we when I finished studying about how beautiful and wonderful humus was, I I I had this master's dissertation. What do I do with it? I didn't know Christine Jones at the time. I'd sent it to her. <laughs> <laughs> and thank goodness I did, because she, she got it out. But the other thing I did, I thought, Christine, I want to build humus, and now I know why grazing management is so good. Because one of the foundation components of humus is lignin. Lignin is a C6, C3 molecule. So when, it, when the microbes break it up, the C6 becomes the building block of humus. So lots of lignin, and this is why grazing management works so well because you're letting your grasses mature. You know, some of the DPI, Department of Ag stuff, your best stage of growth to eat it is very young, unlignified material. So you, you, when you're letting the grasses mature, you, you're getting the lignin building block of humus. I think 50, 60% of humus is made from lignin breakdown. So, so, you know, the more grazing management, we got into holistic management and um, you know, we're running 150 cows on two and a half hectare blocks down there, you know, two, or two days, whatever it is, yeah, depending on the growing season. So, so yeah, just, just got pumping. And with the minerals, and, and we're, you know, very bad farm. I'm a very bad farmer. You know, I'm a shocking farmer because I'm always awake doing talks, trying to educate dumb politicians. So, you know, it's, um, I hope there's none in the room. I hope there's only smart ones here. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it's, um, yeah, it, it, you know, to, when, when I see an artist doing holistic management, and I believe it is a real art form, when you are doing it and you are watching those grazing moves, when you are right onto it and you're moving them when exactly you need it, the stage of growth is right, the rest is right, the, and you, you, you can make it sing. And I've seen that. I've done it myself. I've seen my manager at Craft and do it. Now he's busy with the organic meat product and he knows he's not right on. So we, we've got to balance our workload and we're all over the place. He's, he's processing the meat and packaging and transporting and I'm driving all over the country with humans and God knows what so, Yeah, sorry. Glenn, you can't walk away too quick. Um, what are you seeing now in the drought with uh, your higher humus country? What are you seeing in the crops and the and that sort of thing in the morning? And can you comment on what happens with your plants in succession? Yeah, thanks, Richard. Um, it's interesting because I've taken two photos lately of, of Billabong. Um, when we have, we've actually had a couple of showers in the last sort of probably three weeks, um, and they sort of start on the creek and go into our mountain and they're not on the farming country around. I've got two photos on my phone, like, just like that. So, um, and when I first started at Billabong, it was actually a, a full-on rain shadow. I mean, we used to laugh because you'd drive back from Grafton, and it was a bit, it was a degraded property um, 10 years ago, and, and there'd be cloud everywhere. The whole district looked like it had cloud on it, and there'd be a blue patch of sky over this one property. <laughs> that was our Billabong. So, so the, the moisture's definitely changed, and the fogs and the dews, and, but grafting is, you, you know, you've always got wet socks and wet boots and now it's just like the, the beautiful fogs and, yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's big, big changes. So. You know, and, and it's a big call to say that you can influence local water cycling, but if, I think you, you certainly can if, if, if the, the wind isn't howling and you're sort of getting that moisture effect. Actually, there's a, there's a, there's a thing here I'll just read on that. Um, right at the back, but um, I can probably remember it, but um, oh, it's probably not there anyway. But <laughs> <laughs> so scientists have now find, found that there's a lot of biology that help form rain, and some of you may know about it, some of you might not have heard about it, but, but each raindrop has a nuclei, so, so they're, they're <coughs> called bioaerosols, so basically fungal spores and bacteria and all sorts of things. But what scientists have actually measured now, at the onset of the first rain, these bioaerosols pour out of the landscape, the soil and the vegetation at a rate of, um, increased rate of 60 to 160 per cent for the first 10 minutes. So they're actually inducing more rain. So everyone's seen it. If you look at a rainforest, I've got photos of a rainforest pouring these bioaerosols, but we all see it on documentary. We see it in the flesh. 
but it's, it's fungal spores, bacteria. They're actually wired to know when the conditions are right to send their spores up, seed new raindrops, and then come down. And um, we just haven't got a clue how nature's working most of the time, but scientists are starting to get onto it. But, but that, is, that is happening. So, so the, when you think about what we're doing to our landscapes, broadacre as far as toxins, um, killing fungus and all sorts of things, um, yeah, we're really knocking that around. So, so yeah, healthy, healthy soils, and that's that's why rainforests are so why, why forests in general are so important. You know, they they might not be giving us production directly over that land where there's a forest, but actually producing the rain mm -hmm. that we need. And that's why the governments are so failing in their policy because they don't they don't look after the whole state or the whole country. They just you know if we're all fair. missing all of those links in that water cycle so you know the, the moisture is not getting held in the soil because the humus isn't there the vegetation isn't there to pump it up the perennial vegetation you know out our way it's all bare fallow so there's, there's the, the pump isn't there to pump it back up um, the biology because of the chemicals isn't there anymore so so we're, we're breaking all of these stages and previously I think the Australian landscape was a diversity of pastures perennial pastures and forests and crops and then, you know, like, I won't mention Monsanto's name, but, you know, <laughs> when, when Zero Till came in and they just broad acre spread and we said, broader acre gear and we just, you know, all those beautiful perennial pastures that a lot of us grew up respecting and loving um, have been ripped up and, and sprayed to death. And, and so we're losing all of those, you know, really, you know, foundation. Yeah, uh, yeah, well I think I've done it twice because <laughs> um, I've, I've, I've had two 10 year projects now basically um, and the first thing I started to do was shut gates and break paddocks up and, and, and rest paddocks and you, you, if you've got nothing else just just get your animals in one area and, 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 and rest. Just that oxygen in the soil, just you know, it's the main you know, element that we need in the soil for microbes. Is, you know, give it a rest; it'll start to breathe. And but yeah, just just been, yeah, and then and then start working out your plans. But that's what I did. You know, this the Grafton property I got to. All the gates were open, and there was erosion through the gate posts because they have been open that long. Um, it's, and all I had to do was shut a few gates, and all of a sudden it was like, hey, that paddock's got a bit more grass. Yeah, so. Sure, we've got one up the back. I'll go to you first, Imogen, and then Rachel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> we've got about three minutes. Um, I was trying to find a quote, but I couldn't find it. But um, it was about um, organics versus regenerative. So you, you, you've come onto an organic farm, which is completely degraded, yet they're an organic farm. So, so the public are constantly wanting to buy organic, and everyone wants organic. But the fact is that organic farming, after in cropping and in, and in livestock, isn't necessarily doing the best thing for the land. I'm not saying that all organic farmers are like that. A lot of organic farmers are, but there's some organics that can jump through loopholes and still produce monoculture. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, how do we get these messages out that yeah. it's, it's about what the farmer's doing, not necessarily what they're certified? Because you've got farmers doing not certified stuff, which they're still doing great stuff for the land, but they might have to use some inorganics now and then. Yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, how do we get those messages? Yeah, so 
you, 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 you're not saying that I came onto an organic farm. Oh, you, you, I thought you said you did. No, no. no. Oh, okay. Right. No, no, it was conventionally run with chemicals and oh, bad okay. management. I, I, I made it organic. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, right. so, yeah. yeah. But, but I have seen, I have seen organic stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, it, 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 it certainly wasn't organic before I got there. And, no. and look, you... You'll get you'll get a lot of um, Western graziers that are organic that, that don't use anything, and a lot of them aren't the best grazing managers. You know, they'll they'll really work hard, and I, I don't necessarily agree with that. But you'll get conventional blokes doing the same. But the, the problem I have with that debate about organics, and you know, and I'll be up front with you because I'm an organic farm, um, and we we started off conventional. I was a conventional farmer. I went biological, and then I wasn't using any chemicals, so I went. And um, the market, that, that was to try and get a dollar back from the marketplace because it's well recognised that there's no toxins in organic food. That if there is, there's a, there's a problem, you know. So, um, but the, the problem I have with that debate about organic versus regenerative or free range or whatever is I think we're picking on the wrong target. If people are picking on organic farmers, you know, there's plenty of other fights to have with people that are doing a lot worse than the farmer that isn't using toxins. So, I, I just I just don't like going there. And the other thing, we, we, we have organic pig. We're one of the few organic pig producers in the country. Um, but we pay a fortune for organic feed. So we're actually supporting the organic grain farmer as well, not to use toxins. You can do a free range pig, but you can use toxic grain to do a free range pig. <laughs> so you're actually, you're actually supporting a toxic grain farm. So, you know, like that, I'm just telling you up front, I don't like that whole connotation there. But, but you're, you're right. If you're not if you're not producing a nutritious product because you're you're not adding a few minerals, if you're just mining your soil, um, <laughs> I'm trying to go to this next question. But yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, I I, th I think we can all do a lot better. But I think yeah, um, most organic farmers don't last long if they don't look after their soil. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And I and I don't mind biological farming either. And, and I, I've got a lot of friends that cannot go organic because of one pest or another. I just think you've really got to watch what that non-organic farm is using because I don't like synthetic fertiliser much either. Yeah, small amounts probably okay, but yeah. Sorry. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry, I have to ask this. Here tonight we're talking about carbon sequestration as an answer to climate change, or as a part of the solution to climate change. Water, a big body of water can hold a large amount, it can contain a large amount of energy, heat as energy. I'm not the best chemist around this, but so the lot. ocean holds a whole lot of heat, it stores it. So if we have hydrated landscapes, thanks to humus, thanks to grazing management and other practices, are we kind of missing a whole part of the equation that we could be, if, if management is changed on a landscape level to hold a lot of water via humus, is there potential there to pretty much immediately draw down a lot of heat from the atmosphere, which we kind of need to do right now? Absolutely, and I think the, the temperature difference between a, a bare landscape and a well vegetated, well hydrated landscape is six degrees. So, you know, when we're talking 2% increase, but, but over a wide area, it's going to make a huge difference. Um, so, absolutely, I tell us one of the, one of the greatest okay. tools. So, it's. it's, it's I've been aware that it's just not talked about. Because double, so double wing. Absolutely. And then you get the, um, can't say the word, is it albedo effect, like the cloud? Yeah, so you're getting reflection of heat from the cloud that you form by having the water cycle back in order, which was a big, we haven't had much of that lately. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, and there's other benefits too. I think in 2012, when we we're actually getting a really wet year in Australia, the sea levels actually dropped a little bit. So when, you know, so there must have been other countries getting good seasons as well, but if the soil was healthy, held more water, we actually, start to do something about sea levels as well so which we may need to do very shortly the the rate at which the arctic and antarctic are melting so um mind you we've got very little land area and, and more and more of it's getting trashed with development so 
Um, you know, my my take home statement today was we need more we need more respect and support for um, for regenerative farming, basically, and you know, healthy healthy soil and healthy landscapes. It's probably more a comment that, that agriculture day and, and, pop, and politically we talk about feeding the world and we can't feed the world. <laughs> but my suggestion is that we're, we're producing quantity and not quality. Yeah. And if we produce quality, then we wouldn't need the quantity. Yeah, well, we, we, we know there's a hell of a lot of waste and we know there's a hell of a lot of people dying from obesity, which is largely a result of trying to get satisfied from eating the wrong food. But there was that old saying, you had an apple a day, keep the doctor away, yeah. because our apples are so nutrition or we now have to eat five a day and that's why we're getting fat. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, so feeding, feeding the world is, yeah, it should be about quality and nutrition, we should be eating a lot less, so, um, yeah. Our food's not good. I don't think so. Um, I don't think, you know, feeding the world is the argument. I mean, you talk about you can get pigs and you can't buy bacon with, uh, with uh, Australian you know, and pork that's yeah, going yeah. to come from overseas. Yeah, no, it's it doesn't have to. And, and, and big trees, bacon's extremely scarce as well, I found out. <laughs> I can't <laughs> seem to get anything. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Off the bat? Just a question about the relationship with sequestering carbon and humans. Yeah. I just and what's the relationship there is inactive like sequestered carbon does it um, have a role or is, does it need to be in the form of humans? Oh there's, um, there's different fractions of the humus the humic acids, fulvic acids and then something called human and that's the one that sort of lasts for a thousand years so just depending on, on how the um, microbes and everything are operating um, the com I think the composition of the plant material they're actually incorporating into the soil. So yeah, the whole quality of, of the whole um, vegetation and the mineralization and lack of chemicals, um, your microbial health, then helps to tie those um, organic compounds that, that humus together. And so the better that all is, and this is something that's hardly been touched on, um, the longer lasting we're going to get that um, carbon sequestered in the ground. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's, a big, it's a big healthy picture and uh, you know it's a bit like the water cycle at the moment we've been on the downward spiral. Um, you know you start getting the pieces together and you start getting the upward spiral and, and carbon sequestration and getting carbon out of the atmosphere it's the same soil health, um, human nutrition and, and just getting all the pieces together and this is why we need 50 year policies. You know, we, we can't do this in a 12 month period. We, you know, probably the drought strategies are based around 12 months or something. You know, we, and, and a few people, that's something we could sort of take away as well. A few people are trying to get some sort of funding out of this drought that'll, that'll put into a policy for regenerative farming for alleviating droughts in 10 years' time rather than just this one. So, yeah. Stop it there. Yes. <laughs> 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 if you have any more questions for Glenn, uh, there'll be opportunity to ask again. And I'd just like to now invite my next guest speaker, Jason Simmons, our local speaker for tonight. Um, Jason might be one of the busiest people in Armadale, between running his own place, managing another 2,000 acres, um, running a salary business and also a soil consultancy. And tonight, he's offered to share his story with regenerative agriculture. And yeah, thank you, Jason. Cool, thanks, you. Well, I know, I'd like to start. <laughs> In the light. <laughs> um, I'd like to start by thanking everybody for coming. Um, I know when Ben and I first started, we'd get 10 people. Richard Maycomb as well, there'd be 10 people, there'd be the same 10 people at the next conference. <laughs> so 
you know, there was there was a, a stage where that it just wasn't going anywhere. The people like Christine Jones and Neil Kinsey and, and all those guys basically did the hard hard yards to try and get people to start looking. And, and when it started, it was only a very few. So it's really, really good to see. Good to know tonight. So we went to a biological conference in Lismore a couple of years ago, um, and there was 450 people to it. So it really shows there is interest, and, and look, the hard yards of the early guys have really put it where we are today. So I just wanted to basically give my, um, I suppose, my talk of where we, where we came from and how the, the process happened. It's, it's not about actually getting everything perfect. It's about having a go. Um, don't want people to go, no, it's too hard. I've learned to have to compromise. I'm a bit like uh, Glenn with the Monsanto deal. Um, I hate Roundup. But if you tell a farmer not to use Roundup, they go, no, it's too hard, I can't do anything. So they do nothing. So I've had to change my view and what I expect from clients that come and talk to us about their, their soils, their farms, whatever. And, and if you get a person to change a little bit every time you see them, it does make a difference in the end. So basically, I suppose our story is that, you know, our family, um, there's four of us, my, my wife and two boys, we run a salary, which is most of our, our time. Um, so it, uh, we build stock saddles and sell them all over the world and pole across and camp drafting, that sort of stuff. So we're in a unique business that's everything's handmade, takes a lot of time. So uh, I sort of learned that, uh, I did my trade in 86. In the 1990s I left and went wool classing. Uh, we then, wool crashed, I then end up back into, into the salary game. Uh, found salary was, you know, it was only a means to an end for me to go farming. We still say that. Um, <laughs> so uh, we we manage another two thousand acres down the road, which we uh, we leased at one stage. It was sold. A uh, doctor bought it, so we, we end up we uh, advise and manage for him. Uh, he's trying to do more and learning more on the process of, of regenerative ag and understanding a bit of that stuff, which he's now relating to human health as well as a radiologist. So he's starting to see some of that stuff. Um, we also run a consulting business. It's basically because people turned up to our farm buying a saddle and we ended up talking for three hours about soils. Um, <laughs> what do you do differently? What, what is it that you do that is different to the neighbours? Because it is visually, it's there. So you drive up a boundary fence and, and you can see. <coughs> so our consulting business basically derived from, uh, I did, uh, I, I studied with Neil Kinsey in the States um, was actually in Dubbo, he came from the States. Uh, Derek and I had done Kinsey for, for three, four years. Uh, we became Kinsey agronomists. Um, I then sort of ventured out a little bit and, and changed what I was doing a bit. Uh, I went, uh, did study some stuff with Hugh Lovell. Uh, we, we then understood a little bit more, uh, or I felt we understood more about um, the soil testing procedures and, and what was happening with with uh, with our, our soil testing procedures in standard aren't telling us what's in the soil. So it's telling us what might be able to be available to a plant. So the the process of what we were doing was flawed from the start. So once we learnt about the Kinsey side of it and, and how all the minerals play a role and they're all equal and and there was percentages that we required. Um, I also did some stuff with Hugh Lovell to do totals testing, so we were understanding a bit more about what was in the in the soil. So it's not perfect. Um, I think even you know Derek will tell me the same story. You know, we, soil testing is not that accurate at this point that we know everything. It's it's a point where that we've got enough information to make decisions. So it's not the be all and end all, it's not the only thing to be doing. So, you know, there's, there's all this other stuff, the humus, and, and there's so much more to the story than just soil testing. So we, we try to get people started, we, we look at their soils to start with, we look at mineral deficiencies, we look at animal um, nutrition issues, so if they've, if they've got ailments, 
Uh, we look at plant issues, we look at symptoms on their farms, we look at weeds, we try to work out to relate all these issues to a mineral deficiency or a, a management issue or whatever it may be. So we're looking at trying to look at the whole of the, of the project to work out where we're gonna go. So it's not necessarily that we need to to go and mineralise the soil straight away, or that sort of stuff. Like it, it's, it may be just management. It may be just you know, you, there's nothing in the budget. We need to do more of, of the grazing side of it. So it's very flexible in what we're doing. So we're not trying to force people to sell product. We're not flogging product to them. It's just it's a it's an avenue to to <coughs> to make people aware of where they're at. So. I'll we'll go on a bit further. The farm management side, the consulting business, um, our farm is 480 acres. Uh, we're southeast of Armidale. We're at 1,050 metres. Um, we run an Angus breeding enterprise. We run a few sheep and we've inherited a few goats. So we, the mohair goes in the saddles. So we can't buy mohair in Australia anymore. So we're uh, growing our own. <laughs> so, um, our property has been in the in the Simmons family since the 1960s. It was um, was a forest uh, before we got hold of it. It was rung bark, and the timber was carted into the power station in Armidale. So basically, everything was exported. Uh, it wasn't even burnt on the on the property. So most of it was taken away. Um, so in those days, clearing, burning, ploughing, planting pastures, chemical furt, that was just considered the norm. So it was uh, it's a light granite soil. Uh, it's, um, it was completely run down when we, we took over. Uh, so in the 1990s, we took over the, the, the running of the farm. Um, it was running, well, sorry, I'm a saddler, I'm in, in acres and feet and inches. Um, so we were running 1.6 DSC per acre, uh, which wasn't very good. Uh, I did list management in the early 90s, thanks to Campbell. Um, Campbell did it at Tamworth and then he came back and told me that we've just got to do this. This is just, you know, it's just we've got to, got to see the way this happens. It's decision making. It's gr the, the thing about risk management, everybody gets the salt raising bit. They forget the decision making processes. Um, the decision making process is so important. It's, it's, um, it's what drives the, the people to think differently. And that's what it did for me. Uh, we changed the way we thought. We looked at everything with an open mind. We, we tried to not take things for granted. Um, we were looking at the bigger picture. We were trying not to treat symptoms. We were trying to find the cause of all these problems. And it, it, and it does take a lot. Um, when we were managing, when we were, when we were leasing the farm we managed in, um, we had a lot of issues with plant poisonings and cattle. And, and we were killing a lot of cattle on a product called rock fern. Um, it's just a tiny little fern, you need a handful to kill a cow. Um, they die of renal failure, it's not very nice. Um, but they only eat it because they're copper deficient. So, we had a, a, I had a file of births, deaths and marriage as I called it. Um, <laughs> and I took it to a vet and he said, look I've never met a bloke with so much luck and all bad. So, <laughs> it was just bad luck that all that happened. Um, there was nothing, you know, the vets when they were doing the autopsies, they said, you have a look around, do you see anything? You know, my cow's dead, so we just look at the cow. It's not, you know, it's not that the trees are dying or, you know, there's, it, it, it was just the cow. So it was just so isolated and it, it was very, very difficult to, to get people to look outside that. So I sort of spent some time and interviewed agronomists. I had, had about 25 agronomists and just said, like, oh, what, what would you do? Um, we did a few things, uh, had some heartfelt disasters and, and uh, learnt a lot from it. Um, it's only a failure if you don't learn from it. So whatever you do, whether you just have a go, it's only a failure if you don't learn. So the learning is building your knowledge. So, um, so basically after realistic management, uh, we doubled our stocking rate. Um, within 12 months, we uh, went from, from 1.6 to 3.2. But we realised that we couldn't fatten anything. So we were running twice as much stock, but we weren't finishing it. So I then sort of realised that it was a nutritional issue. Um, I had been exposed to Brookside Laboratories. Actually, um, 
by a now politician, which was really interesting. Um, we then studied with Neil Kinsey. Uh, I studied biology, hydrology, biodynamics, animal nutrition, all this stuff. So people such as Hugh Lovell, Jerry Bonetti, Joel Salatin, uh, Neil Kinsey, Arden Anderson, Gary Zimmer, Peter Andrews, Christine Jones. These are all names that, that these are the people that have put us to where we are now. So this is, these are the people that have dragged us out of conventional farming and got us to where we are now. So we went and implemented our new knowledge. We had some successes and some hard earned lessons. Um, after mineralizing, we actually doubled our weight gains. So we couldn't join our heifers at 12 months. Uh, we were getting 280 kilos. Um, after we mineralized our soils and we were still soil grazing, uh, we, we were getting at least 400s. The heaviest heifer we joined last year was 530 at 12 months. So it's, things have changed dramatically. It's not, you know, people say, oh, is there a production in this? You know, can you fatten stock? Can you, people are continually trying to uh, justify whether we can afford to do this. I still have the saying that we can't afford not to. So we have to mineralize our soils. We have to get on this way. So I've made a heap of dot points here of, of balancing cycles. So water cycle, mineral cycle, life cycle, carbon cycle, humus, ground cover, plant diversity and wildlife. So they're all things that we consider in what we're trying to, to, to balance those cycles. And they're all part of the big picture. So outcomes that we had were happiness and pleasure. So we actually, it became fun. Farming, farming, when I grew up, my dad, he spent a lot of time cutting down things and killing things. <laughs> if, it, if it didn't move, you cut it down. If it did, you shot it. <laughs> so um, once we started to get things happening, it was fun. It was really fun. You know, we were, we were spending every weekend treating animal health issues. All that disappeared. Um, the social side of it. The social side is an interesting one because now we've got a group and thanks to these guys it's it's actually getting somewhere so in the early days you were ridiculed, ridiculed by neighbors and you felt like you were doing it alone so now we're at a point where that it's not being ridiculed we've got enough people to make this momentum and we have started it it's just the, the turnout tonight is is wonderful to see that we're not alone anymore, and I know Glenn's been the same. We, we've all been fighting and fighting, and, and Richard, and you know, we've all been fighting it alone, thinking that we were here. It's it's bigger than any one of us now. It's it's it, we've all got to get together, and we've got to make this happen. So, the financial side, look, all these outcomes. The, the, the trouble that I have with science is that they they tend to to study things in a controlled environment with a single outcome. And what we're doing as farmers is having an uncontrolled environment and many, many outcomes. So we're looking for things like the pleasure and happiness and social and environmental, financial. We're trying to build resilience in our farms. We're looking at dry matter yield and we're looking at kilos of beef as well. So you know, we're looking at all those things, but they're not the driving factors. They're not. You know, the, the kilos of beef, yes, okay, well that's, that's wonderful, but if you use up your resilience in your soils by getting kilos of beef, you're actually mining your infrastructure. So it's, it's all part of the story. We've got to look at the, at the bigger picture. So tools that we can use as we go along um, is knowledge and education. They're two different things. Knowledge is something that is learnt. You actually feel that. Education is something that somebody's told you. So education to me, there's been a lot of, of misled information there where people don't filter it. They take it for gospel. They actually don't filter it in their own mind and they don't go that, oh, okay, well that doesn't make sense. After you explain Kinsey theory to people and you, you, and you start to relate it to all these other issues, people go, oh wow, that makes sense. And then farming starts to make sense for them. So, the sciences of chemistry, physics and biology, we all use them. But we understand that they're not the nth degree. So if you take a particular experiment and you take it out of that controlled environment, you get a different answer. So 
we have to assess those things and realize that we are actually the scientists. We're the ones that are implementing the information that we've got. So document what you're doing. Like I've got a book right back to the 2000s of exactly what we did and, the, and how we applied and what we applied and what we blended and, and, and you know, the grazing management and how things changed and all that sort of stuff. So a history of, your, of what you've done is a record for you to go, okay, well, I do remember this stuff now. Um, it's very easy to forget. Phones and photos are brilliant. They're a really good, really good tool. So tools are still, we've got grazing, um, soil corrections and, and balancing, pasture cropping, fertilizer, and biological stimulants. They're all tools that we use. Um, none of those are, to me, any better than the others. It's just that we assess all those things to make a decision. So infrastructure was an interesting thing when I started to write this. Um, and this is probably getting to where Glenn was talking about uh, getting governments to understand. Governments sort of look at infrastructure as hay sheds, silos, water and fencing. They don't understand soils, resilience. And, the, and, and having that, the resource of, of soils and having healthy soils and resilience within our soils is crucial because it is an infrastructure for the, for the country. It's not just for the farmer. Um, you know, they were giving infrastructure grants for water, um, but they can't recognise that it's actually soils that give us the return. Mm. So infrastructure in soils is really, really important. So resilience is a part of that. Um, and then we've got also infrastructure, we've got knowledge and education. So to me, knowledge is power. We really need to get as much information as we can. We've got to start somewhere. Don't think, you know, the stupid question is the one that wasn't asked. So don't think that you um, you need a massive knowledge before you get started. It's a matter of get out there, have a go. If you make a mistake, that's fine. Go over. You know, we all make mistakes. It's just, you know, if you learn from it, it's fine. It's not a mistake. Um, the life processes in what we're doing, you know, the plants, the animals, biology, the light, the photosynthesis, all those things are part of what we're building, what we're trying to assess, what we're taking into account as we're making those decisions. Uh, and then we're not defined, these are the, we're not defined by the tools we use, and this is where we've, we've, we have been in the past. So it's a bit like the story of the organics. It's holistic management, you know, we're not defined by that. So biodynamics is, is one that I struggle a bit with, is because they, they don't allow anything else in. So you become defined by that, that particular group. Um, so you know, if you get to a conventional farmer, holistic management's just about soil grazing. And it's not, it's much, much more. So don't become defined by words. Holistic management, biodynamics, permaculture, soil grazing, organics, biological, or even regen ag. Don't be defined by it. It's not, it's not a defining word. We're just progressive farmers. We need to, to yes, regen ag is, is the new one. Biological was the last one. Soil grazers, whatever. It's, it's, don't be defined by it. Just continue on and do your, your, what you feel is right for your land. It's, no, it's not an answer that I can give you that is perfect for your land. It's not an answer that Glenn can give you. It's not, it's not that we can say this will give you the golden bullet. And if you're looking for the golden bullet, you're probably looking in the wrong spot. Um, so looking back over the 15 year, 20 year journey of what we, a few of the things that really stood out, um, the mindset of the people involved is probably the major one that stood out to me. So people that tend to want to be involved in regenerative farming have open minds. They, they don't take information as gospel. So they're willing to challenge, they're willing to think, they're willing to look, um, you know, look at the environment and understand how, what they see and whether that's actually healthy or whether it's not. So the, the mindset of the people was probably the major thing that stood out to me in, the, in all the years that we've done this. Um, don't be scared to make a mistake. It's, it's only a mistake if you don't learn from it. Um, assuming that you are wrong and monitoring and monitor that accordingly. So 
assuming that you are wrong doesn't show that you've got a fault. It's just that you're looking at more than the answer that you, look, scientists, they have a perceived outcome. They're already looking for this answer and if it's either it's either worked or it didn't, we're actually looking further than that. We're looking to see whether there's other responses. You know, we're, we're pasture cropping this year. Now I've planted oats, we inoculated seed, it germinated, it came up and it sat there and it hasn't done anything because it hasn't rained. Now, if you were potentially looking at that as yield, it's a failure. But just the seed inoculant, showing that in three days, the root hairs on that, that, that plant were totally covered in soil. That, that, that shield had already been there. You know, those plants are still healthy. They're still sitting there and they still will if it rains. Um, you know, the paddock that we mulched, some of you guys would have been out. The paddock we mulched, we've actually, we got it to about 12 inches of height and um, cows and calves have actually loved that. Um, it's disappeared again. <laughs> so we're waiting for rain. So, um, you know, some of those things that you, you just keep looking for more answers than one. Um, record what you do. Make sure that, you know, when you do an application or, a, you know, you're doing a study or whatever you're doing, take photos, write it down. I've got a book with a map of our farm and what I did on a certain page and I write it on there each time I do it. And there's just pages and pages and pages of stuff back to when we did single super. Like that, we went back in history to try and work out what was back there. So, um, you know, all that information is there. And, and look, it is a scientific approach. We, we're actually collecting and gathering information so that you can make better decisions in the future. Um, understand the process. Two minutes. Two minutes, okay. Understand the process of, of learning, um, of learning how to learn. So, to me, school was all about curriculum. I hated school. It was learning how to just say the right thing when you did the test. I felt school should have been about learning how to learn. Now, learning how to learn is actually having open eyes and open ears and making your own decisions. So, to me, that's a really crucial part and it's part of what we see in the mindset of people involved. Um, two minutes. Don't take the information for gospel. 80% of farm decisions are made on free advice from a salesperson, so just be aware. Um, filtering through your own knowledge, so any decision you're making, you've got to filter through your own knowledge. Uh, outcomes are only your interpretation of the data. So if you're looking for a specific thing and it doesn't come, it's a failure, that's wrong. We need to actually interpret the data in many, many ways and look at any outcome that we can see, whether it's good, bad or indifferent. Add it to your knowledge bank and learn from it. Uh, don't just compare yourself to your neighbour. Try and aim for your full potential. So if you're just doing better than your neighbour, is that really good enough? Uh, I don't think so. I think there's a lot more potential there. So aim for full potential. Uh, becoming engaged and invested in your decisions. So don't go to your local guy and let him make the decisions on what you're <laughs> trying to decide on. Uh, invest in your decisions so that you have make better decisions in the future. Uh, through our consulting business, we believe that we deliver a summary of 15 years of experience, knowledge in this field. So basically all we're trying to do is collectively get our information to you guys so that you don't make the mistakes that we did. Um, this is not the only way to do it. Um, there's plenty of ways. There's plenty of, there's so much information on the internet now. Um, there's so much more than what we started with. We had limited guys that were trying to push this barrow. Nowadays, there's hundreds. So it's a matter of gathering information and just absorbing whatever you can from whatever avenue. Filter it through your own, inf your, your own knowledge and then make a decision whether you're gonna have a go or not. Um, what we're aiming to do is, is make tomorrow better than today, so in all areas. Um, measure that against your preferred outcomes. So it's not about my preferred outcomes, it's not about anybody else's, it's not about yield, it's not about production. If you can't leave your cows every day, it's fine. Do what you can. Get started, do something. Don't try to measure outcomes by somebody else's values. Do it to yours. Um, as a land manager, Explore your knowledge and find the weakest link in your enterprise. 
work out whether you feel that your weakest link is grazing, whether you think it's soils, whether you think it's something else. Just, it's, you're the land manager, you need to make those decisions. Um, Wrapping up. Right, I, um, <laughs> One sentence. Choose, yeah, choose the weakest links um, that you may address. Um, nature does not have constraints as time constraints. Humans are the only ones that have it. Um, so nature can fix it. We want to hurry it up. We have the ability and we have the knowledge to do that. We can do that. Um, resilience is a, is a word like trust and respect. It takes a long time to build, but it can be used up very, very quickly. Um, hopefully we're empowering people to have the confidence, knowledge and evaluating the available information to make better decisions with multiple outcomes towards their goal. So the future for us, um, we're looking at uh, a lot more of biology, we look at uh, quorum sensing with biology, uh, plant intelligence, we're uh, looking at pasture cropping in the summer to try and take advantage of the summer growth period here. We've always been trying to feed, fill the feed gap. Um, and then enjoying and learning from each other. So, thank you for listening. And this is on the back of our sign as you drive out of our, our property. Is the greatest pleasure in life is achieving what people say you can't. Yes. <laughs>